You can call the algebra causal if, a, if a, a collection of lattices are all distributed. So how are we going to form these lattices? Well, in the vector space v to the n, we're going to form our lattice where the generators are v to the i times r times v to the n minus i minus 2. And since it's a lattice, we need to meet and adjoin. So we're going to use vector space addition and vector space intersection in order to get our meet and join. And what does it mean for a lattice to be distributed? Well, just A intersect B plus C is A intersect B plus A intersect C. Uh, and of course, if you want to think of an example where that doesn't happen, the simplest example is three lines through the origin. Right? If you have three lines through the origin and you take one line intersected with uh, the sum of the two others, that's a line intersected with a plane, so you get a line. But if you take two lines and intersect, and in two lines and intersect, you just get nothing. So when you add it together, you still get nothing. So, of course, vector space lattices aren't always distributive, but if this is distributive for every single natural number, then the algebra is considered to be causal. And causality implies numerical causality, so that's where the definition of numerical causality comes from. And it turns out that when, with, when gamma is small, causality and numerical causality are actually equivalent. Numerical causality also implies causality. So it goes back and forth for the, for the kinds of gamma that we're going to be looking at in this talk. Okay, so now we get to the result. Uh, Hilga. Okay, Hilga is a program I wrote this summer. And I wrote it because Retox, Erconic, and Wilson had this great paper that they came out with, which said that the Hilbert series of A gamma, the Hilbert series of B gamma, numerical causality, all of these things could be done with uh, post-set cohomology. So I didn't have time to do a little section on cohomology, or I didn't have time to fit it into the 48 minutes to do the section on cohomology. I actually did it and threw it out. But basically, it's a cohomology result. So you get a bunch of arrows, and if you go twice along the arrows, you get to zero. So you have an image sitting inside a kernel, and you quotient that out to get something called a homology group. And then you reverse all the arrows and you make them go in the opposite direction. You get something called a cohomology group. And the sizes of those cohomology groups are what determine directly the Hilbert series of A gamma, the Hilbert series of B gamma, and numerical causality. Um, so this program was begging to be written because it takes a long time to compute these cohomology groups by hand. And it takes a very short time to do this by machine. So and I wanted to get my hands on you know, the it sizes of these algebras. It takes algebras. time to program. What? It takes time to program. It did take time to program, but it was so much fun. So, <laughs> I, uh, so, so I didn't mind that at all. And what language do you use? Python. I love Python. But uh, yeah. Um, so I wrote it, and I called it Hilga for Hilbert series of layered graph algebras. So that's the H-I-L-G-A. But I'm going to you know, use lower cases for that, because then that got silly after a while. So yeah, so I wrote it in Python, and I wrote it in Python for a number of reasons. I love Python, that's the, the reason I already said, but I noticed in the, uh, the little blurb for, for Zalberger's class downstairs that he's going to be uh, doing some SAGE in uh, the experimental math class next to... Oh, okay. Well, somebody's going to be doing a SAGE demonstration in the class. The SAGE community is a really great community. Uh, they're making a stronger presence at the joint meetings and everything like that. So anyone who's going to Boston should stop by their booth and they'll you put on the 3D glasses and watch their demonstrations. Um, it's also a nice Python community. Oh, SAGE, if anyone doesn't know it, is a collection of mathematical packages for Python. I didn't actually use the packages, but you, it's nice to see how other people have done things when you're writing things for yourself. And I'd like to give a shout out to my Python guru, John Young, because he's always available whenever I have programming questions. And he's been a great assistance throughout all of this. Um, so design principles. So when I was writing Hilga, I had three principles. Uh, one was to sort of minimize the use of outside packages. The real reason I did this is because I wanted to write things myself. It was fun. Uh, I wrote all my own power series operations and matrix operations and everything like that. But the, uh, I guess the main design principles is uh, Hilda's also turned into something of a poset and layered graph machine. So it can check for other properties of posets and layered graphs, and it can actually do, uh, uh, well, it can do calculations involving things like the CD index for other types of graph algebras as well. Uh, and probably everyone here knows Sloan has a really huge database of integer sequences. Well, Hilga has a few posets, not, not a lot in comparison, but it, it's, it's got enough. If anyone has any ideas for properties that Hilga is not searching for, 
that uh, post set properties or graph properties that Hilga doesn't already search for, or has any ideas of, of classes of post sets Hilga doesn't already use, talk to me after, after the talk, because I want to make Hilga as, as big and perfect as possible. Um, but the first things Hilga was taught to do was to find the Hilbert series. And there's many different ways to do this. That Mobius function trick that I showed you guys before, that doesn't work for B gamma at all. And it only works for certain A gamma. So um, I pulled out all the different results, that, all the different ways that you can get Hilbert series for A gamma and B gamma. And I taught Hilga how to use them. And Hilga can also find numerical causality using the cohomology groups of the post sets involved. And we get to Hilga's big result. And this is a result I want to talk about today. When these algebras A gamma were first discovered long ago, the following conjecture was made. It was thought that for every uniform graph, the algebra A gamma was causal. So it had that causal property. And it turned out that in 2008, there was a surprise. Mathematicians Tom Cassidy and Brad Shelton found the first example of a gamma for which A gamma is not causal. It has 18 edges and 11 vertices. And I'm going to call this the Cassidy-Shelton graph or Cassidy-Shelton post set, um, depending on what word I choose to use. And it wasn't until 2010, Retox, Erconic, and Wilson uh, realized you could remove an edge, and the resulting uh, graph would still not be causal. Uh, but it's uniform and everything else it has all the other properties it needs. And this gave us an example with 17 edges and 11 vertices. And it wasn't until Hilga was created that we found a smaller example. A single vertex could be removed, and the resulting algebra would be non-causal. However, it has to be removed from the second highest level, otherwise you lose uniformity, and then causality doesn't even make sense. Though there is a way to extend causality to non-quadratic algebras. That's way out there. So this gave us the minimal example, and it looks like this. But that's not the result I wanted to show, because once I got this, me and Hilga got to wondering, what is the smallest one? How are we going to do this? So in order to do this, what Hilga is going to have to do, I realize, is compute all the layered graphs up to isomorphism. So um, I decided to write some code to do that. And then what Hilga could do is Hilga could look downward at all the post sets with fewer vertices and see if any of those were non-causal. So this would be a proof. And of course, we have the world expert on computer-aided proofs in the room with me, but sort of the most naive way that you can prove something with computer is if you only have finitely many cases, have the computer look at all of them. And if you have a property or something that does not have a property, just have the computer pick the smallest according to some ordering that you set. So that's, what, that's the kind of proof that Hilga did here. But it is a good proof. It's a brute force proof, but it's a good proof. In order to do that, Hilga had to be able to compute all layered graphs up to isomorphism. So I wrote uh, all of that into Hilga myself. Uh, basically, I specify the number of vertices I want at each level, and Hilga constructs it bit by bit, sort of recursively, and then checks up to isomorphism. Um, we do require a minimal vertex and uniformity, so this lowered the number of cases. Um, but Hilga is pretty efficient. When I first did this, it took Hilga four hours to do uh, the, uh, the, the calculation. Now it takes two and a half seconds. Uh, for Hilga to do it. So I have sped things up greatly. That's for finding the graphs up to isomorphism on the width that I needed, which was all widths. I actually did less than the Cassidy Sheldon example. But Okay, so Hilga was able to find the smallest non-causal algebra. It occurred when the widths were 1, 2, 3, 2, 1. That was the way the output looked at the time. It looks different nowadays. And that's the picture. So there it is. There's the result. So this is the unique minimal example. It has only nine vertices and has 13 edges. And Hilga showed that no non-causal example exists on fewer vertices. Uh, then Hilga ran through the whole thing again with an edge proof to show that no example exists with fewer edges as well. So this is it. And we're going to, this is a, a, a neat little layered graph. I'm going to call it H after Hilga. So the Hilga graph or the Hilga post set. And here's one way you can get to it. So since, since this post set was found, I've been looking at different ways uh, that you can get to it. And this one had pretty pictures, so I decided to put this in my talk. Uh, suppose you start with a torus. So what we can do then is we can put some edges on the torus. So I'm going to put one edge here, one edge here. And if you picture the torus as, say, sitting on a table, picture an edge where it sits on the table. So below this torus right here, below that, there's an edge on the bottom. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to label the surfaces, the edges, and the vertices. So what are the surfaces? Well, if you're stuck on one part of the surface here, you can't get to the other surface because you have these two rings here blocking your path without going over an edge. So we have two separate surfaces. We have four edges, one around here, one around there, and then one here and one here. So like that and that, that and that. And then two vertices where those edges meet, there and there. And what you can draw is you can draw what's next to each other, what's connected to each other, and you get this, which also happens to be not causal, but it's also too big to be Hilda's post set. So if you take out E2 or E3, you'll see we get this thing like Hilga. This is the Hilga post set again, with the three uh, edges going down to one, and the two going down to the other, where the two are the ones on the outside, with this pattern here. You can't actually remove E1 or E4 at all, because otherwise you lose uniformity. Because uh, S2 and E2, E3, if you see here, we have these two edges that have the common tail. And even though there is an up-down sequence, there's not an up-down sequence below S2, so that would not be uniform. So we would lose the quadratic algebra. And about how much time do I have left? Six, uh, six minutes. Six minutes, perfect. Six and a half minutes. Okay, six and a half minutes, that's even better. Uh, we can talk about the neighbors of Hilga, so, uh, or the Hilga poset. So you've seen a bunch of pictures right now of non-causal layered graphs. Uh, so what we can ask is we could say, let's take a little neighborhood containing all of them. So I'll just arbitrarily set this neighborhood to be width 3 and height 4, and we'll look at all the non-causal post sets there. And Hilgo can really quickly tell us there's 33 non-causal uh, post sets up to isomorphism in that neighborhood around Hilga. And we can ask, how do they relate to each other? Well, how, what kinds of relations might we be interested in between graphs? And one is collapsing a graph into another a graph by a series of identifications. Now, what we don't want to do is identify, say, the top vertex with the bottom vertex, because otherwise you get infinite chains and then everything breaks down. But we can allow as many identifications as we want, as long as each pair of identifications takes place between vertices at the same level. So if we do that, um, we get the following theorem. Hilke gives us the following theorem. All layered graphs in the neighborhood of H collapse to H, except for the Cassidy-Shelton post set C. And I felt good, because this way that post set's still special. The one that Cassidy, Shelton found, Cassidy and Shelton found, that's still a very special post set, because it's minimal in, in that sense. There's nothing below it in terms of collapsing. If you collapse, it's, it's uh, not, no longer going to be non-causal. Um, obviously, it doesn't collapse to anything else in the neighborhood as well, because if it collapsed to something else in the neighborhood, and everything else in the neighborhood collapses to H, then it would collapse to H. And that gave me an idea. You see, we have transitivity here. So why not make a post set of post sets? So uh, if you make a post set of the post sets and you draw the relation of what collapses into what, we get a graph. And so far, I've done all the, talk, all the graphs in my talk through this program DIA. However, the next graph I'm going to do with Absoft because there's a lot of vertices. And it might be hard to see with all 33. It is hard to see, but not too hard to see. That's the Hilga post set right there. And here's everything collapsing down to Hilga, except for number 25. You can't really read the numbers too well. But number 25 is not there, because that's the cassidy Shelton post set, and it doesn't collapse down to any of these. OK, what other relations did you have between graphs? The induced relation. So we can take uh, h is less than g whenever h is an induced subgraph of g, which means uh, you can pull out vertices and pull out all the edges connected to that vertice vertex. But you can't just take out an edge if you feel like it. So if we do the induced relation, what do we get? We get two minimal cases, H and the graph we saw before, which is the cassidy sheldon post set with one vertex removed. And that's what we get, this and this. And then finally, you could just say, hey, I'm going to take subgraphs. You have to be careful not to use lose uniformity. And if you have stray vertices, then suddenly you'd have another minimal vertex. So you could pluck off stray vertices and pluck off edges as you want, as long as you're still making sense. But if we do that, we can get the relation between the 33, and that's this. And this graph I did with this uh, website called uh, AppSoft Beluga, and it's actually a great website. It, it's helped me a lot. But uh, I only used it for these three graphs in the talk. Uh, there's some maximal examples here, but remember not to put too much weight on the maximals here, because we sort of arbitrarily made a cutoff of height 4 and width 3. So uh, don't place too much weight on that. But this is, once again, the Hilga post set, and this is going to be the Cassidy Sheldon with the one vertex removed. Is and this is that other maximal one. Yep. Is that kosher? Huh? Oh, is this causal? Yeah. 
I never actually tried that. <laughs> it doesn't have a minimal vertex, so we'd have to do something about it, but um, I, well, I don't even know. Actually, it probably wouldn't be uniform, but I have to look. Yeah. It probably doesn't even make sense there. But that's actually a good question. Questions I haven't thought of. Hilga's very quick at this. So right now it's the point that I'm just desperately looking for more questions. Because I have fun giving it to Hilga. And I don't know if Hilga has fun solving it. But I have fun watching <laughs> Hilga solve it. Okay. Uh, this is the other maximal one. Not that that, makes, that means very much here. Um, but the two minimals are the ones I said before. And that's almost the end of my talk. Three minutes? Okay, perfect. Um, another conjecture that we had involved descent vectors. So one measure of the degree of a layered graph, in order to get the degree of a layered graph, what you can do is you can go level by level and take the downward degree, the number of edges leaving out of that vertex. And then for each layer, we're going to take all the vertices, take all the downward degrees, and list them in ascending order. And we're going to do that for each of the layers. So we're going to make a vector of vectors or a list of lists for example, in the Cassidy-Sheldon graph, there's nothing leading out of that, so we get 0. There's 1, 1, and 1, so we get 1, 1, and 1. 2, 2, and 2, so we get 2, 2, and 2. And we make a descent vector, which tells us the number of edges leading out for each level of our layered graph. And there was a conjecture that any two uniform graphs with the same descent vector generate algebras B gamma with the same Hilbert series. So this is not too strong. It's not saying it generates the same algebra B gamma, just algebras B gamma with the same Hilbert series. And if you think about the relations from B gamma, it kind of makes sense because they're all determined by the descent. But no. And Hilga was the one to disprove it. Um, both, and not only did Hilga disprove it, Hilga put her post set in the, in the minimal counter example again. It actually turns out this is the minimal counter example. Uh, Hilda, Hilda's post set has Hilbert series 1 plus 8t plus 5t squared. This one has 1 plus 8t plus 5t squared plus t cubed. The coefficients, if any of you are wondering, do the coefficients say anything about the graph? Yes, but by the time you get to t cubed, it's actually getting a little complicated. Uh, the coefficient of t is just the vertices above the minimal. And the coefficient of t squared is uh, edges minus vertices. But yeah, by t cubed, it's getting more complicated to see just from the graph. But it was very nice to see that post set show up again as a minimal counterexample to something else. So that was really fun. Oh, and if anyone's wondering, uh, it's not just because this is not causal and this is. Because you can look for causal examples, counterexamples, and non-causal counterexamples, and, and they have them as well. And I'm just going to end with a pretty picture, because I always like to end with a pretty picture. So unrelated pretty picture, unrelated to the result, but, but related to Hilga. Uh, Call a post set palindromic if the algebra B gamma has palindromic coefficients. So the coefficients of the Hilbert series are a palindrome. And let's search for, you know, put some limits on our search so we don't fill the slide with a thousand examples. And here are the examples of height four with three um, with palindromic Hilbert series. And those are all of them. And thank you, thank you very much. Everybody, happy to answer questions in private. Thank you for coming.